Friends, last week we began a new sermon series together, studying the Sermon on the Mount, as Pastor Brandon mentioned earlier in the service. The Sermon on the Mount appears only in the Gospel of Matthew. The scripture says that that Jesus looked out and saw crowds that had gathered to hear him. So he went up a mountainside, sat down, and began to teach. And that's what composes these three chapters that are, are the Sermon on the Mount. While there are only three chapters, they provide a whole variety of short little teachings on a whole variety of subjects. In fact, some of the most familiar teachings come from this Sermon on the Mount. The Beatitudes are here and the text, that, the teaching that says you are the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world. That's a part of the Sermon on the Mount. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you is there. Even the teaching of the Lord's Prayer falls in this long block of teachings we call the Sermon on the Mount. So as Pastor Brandon and I looked over all of these teachings and thought about ways we might be able to break them up to make them easier to tackle and, and share with all of you, we noticed that there are a few phrases that appear again and again in the sermon. Three phrases that are repeated that Jesus uses as a teaching technique using repetition. So last week, Pastor Brandon shared with you about the first, the sections that begin with, you have heard it said, but now I say to you. And this week, we'll explore an example of the second, in which Jesus begins, everyone who... Friends, let's explore together, listening for the whisper of the Spirit. Will you pray with me? Holy One, you are good, and your mercy knows no ending. We pray a blessing over this time together, that you would be present with us, that you would calm our restless minds and restless spirits, that we might hear your word for us this day. In the precious name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Did you have a favorite bedtime story as a child? A story that your parent or a sibling maybe an auntie read to you just before you closed your eyes and dozed off. Maybe you had a creative loved one who recited a story from memory or one that even made up stories for you each night. When I was a young child, my siblings and I had a favorite story that my dad would tell us in the evening before bed. It was the story of the three little pigs. My dad was often a pretty serious person, but his sense of humor came alive when he was telling this story of the pigs and how they carefully crafted their houses out of straw and out of sticks and then finally out of bricks. And the wolf came and blew the houses down. That was our favorite part because my dad would shake his whole body as the buildings collapsed. Whenever I hear this scripture, this parable that Donna just read for us about the builders who build on rock and on sand, I can't help but think of that story of the three little pigs. It has the same kind of vibe, right? Less pigs and wolves, but other than that, you know, they're similar. But this story that Jesus tells, it's a, it's a story about the importance of your building materials, of the work, of the effort and time that you're willing to put in to whatever it is that you're crafting. This parable comes at the very end of the Sermon on the Mount. You might say that it's the grand finale or perhaps the summary. All of what Jesus has said can be summarized by saying, build your foundation on the rock that is God. Build your foundation on the rock that is God. Got it? Maybe I could just Stop the sermon right there. Except that as I was telling Pastor Brandon earlier, I asked him, what does that even mean? What does it actually mean? What in the world does it mean to build your foundation on God? What in the world, how do you know when you're doing it? How do you know if you're actually built on rock or if you're actually built on sand and just think you're on rock? How do you do it? 
for me, this is one of those metaphors in scripture that it's easy to just sort of nod in agreement with, but you don't really have any understanding of what Jesus is asking of us. At least that's how, how I have often read this passage. But the beautiful thing about the teachings of Christ is that we are ever invited to dig deeper, to imagine, and to explore what it is that he's actually saying. So in order to understand the meaning of this parable, this metaphor, it's important that we look back at what Jesus has already said earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, at what he shared and, and what he's taught the crowds. While the Sermon on the Mount covers a variety of topics, they're sort of all interconnected in some ways. If you read the whole sermon in its entirety, you won't find many places where Jesus says, listen, this is what you have to believe. And you won't hear a lot of like, let me explain to you the meaning of life. There isn't a lot of theological exposition in the sermon or or a lot of doctrine. He's not telling us exactly what it is to think. Instead, this is what my seminary professor would call a boots on the ground type of sermon. Most of the teachings that it holds lift up or at least point to certain behaviors that believers ought or ought not to do. Some of these are couched in beautiful language like Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. But even those beautiful messages, they still point to an action. They, that one invites you, for example, to pray and, and draw close to the divine, asking that your needs be met. There's always an action that they point to. So if the rest of the Sermon on the Mount is intended to provide concrete instructions for the listeners, then his final parable about the wise man and the foolish man should be read with that context in mind as well. What's interesting about this story is that while one builder is called wise and the other builder is called foolish, there actually aren't that many other distinctions between them. They both do the same thing, for example. They work hard to build a shelter for themselves. They're not like the three little pigs. Remember the first two play for most of the time and then just sort of throw together the straw house and the stick house. This isn't like that. The builders work hard and they craft these, these homes. And from the outside looking in, their houses may have looked completely identical. It's not that the foolish man is lazy. What sets him apart is that rather than digging deep and building his home on the rock foundation, he builds it sort of from the ground up. He sets it on top of the sand and builds it there. The wise man, on the other hand, he takes the time to dig deep into the earth. The word wisdom that's used here to describe him has an emphasis on, on inner contemplation and on thoughtfulness. It has less to do with the things that we usually associate with wisdom, like knowledge or education, intelligence, or many years of experience. The wise man, this word for wise doesn't imply those things. Instead, his wisdom is because of his action. It's his choice to dig deep. That's what makes him wise. And that choice comes out of his thoughtfulness about life. And sure enough, the text tells us he was right to do so. The storm arrives and both men experience it in the same way. Their circumstances are exactly the same. The rains come down. The streams flood and the winds blew and beat against their houses. The difference between them isn't what they experience, but it's the effect of those problems on their lives. That's what's really different. One home stood firm and the other came crashing down. So what does that mean for us though? How, how do we dig deep? and brace ourselves with the foundation on rock. 
Jesus actually gives us the answer right in the text, but it's really easy to miss. It's our phrase of the week. Jesus says, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who builds on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, putting them in the practice is what's different between these two men. So the difference for us is between hearing Jesus' words and choosing to act on them. It's about hearing the words of the Sermon on the Mount and, and of all of scripture, and then letting them change us, change our hearts from the inside out. You see, the words and the teachings of our scriptures aren't intended to just be read and, and memorized or quoted at someone else, right? The words of our scripture are meant to be dwelled on. They are meant to be lived. We are called to practice them each day. In fact, the Greek word that's used in the text when it says, put them, everyone who hears the word and puts them into practice, it's actually an active word. It's, it's not a one-time thing. It's not saying, if you have read these and used to put them into practice, that's not what it means. It holds a meaning that is continual and ongoing. So you could say, everyone who hears these words of mine and continues to act on them each and every day is like the wise man who builds his house on the rock. We are called to live the teachings of Christ, of all of scripture, in each moment of our lives. We're called to live them in each interaction that we have with others. Each time that we make a choice, we are meant to take time in scripture to discern what it is that God is calling us to do. That's what it means to build on the rock. And it's hard. It, it takes a lot of practice. It takes effort. It's a choice each and every day to wake up because some days, I, I admit, some days I'm built on the rock and other days I am built fully on the sand because I don't wake up with that intention in my heart that day. But it's so critical that we do. It's so important for us to take the time to ground ourselves on the foundation of, of God. Because each and every one of us will face storms in our lives. In my seminary library, there was an umbrella stand and engraved on it, it said, God makes it rain on the just and on the unjust. A good reminder, right? We will all experience the rain, my friends. The storms of life are inevitable. Relationships become, relationships become strained or, or crumble. Health fails. Jobs are lost. Loved ones make choices that create distance and separation between us. Pandemics happen. So much of life is out of our control that no matter who we are or how much support or money we have, the storms of life always come. Perhaps some of us who are gathered here this morning are in the midst of a storm as we speak. I know for me, the storm of grief is still swirling around me as I continue to mourn the loss of my dad and figure out what life looks like without him. How about you? Are you feeling any winds whip around you in this season? Friends, in the midst of the storm, it is really hard to stay standing if you don't already have a firm foundation, a faith that runs, be, runs deep. Once the storm hits, it's really hard to try to get your foundations deeper, to try to dig in the midst of the storm. You can't build in a storm. Have you ever tried to hold a piece of plywood when it's windy? I have, and it did not go well. It's too late to try to build once the storm has begun. We have to do that beforehand. It has to happen each day of our lives to help prepare us. 
to help prepare our hearts to stand firm. So friends, let's take these words of Christ seriously and continue, or, or perhaps for some of us, begin the work of digging deep now. Let us be intentional about taking time each day to read our scriptures, to read the teachings, and then take time intentionally to put them into action, to make them habits in our lives. May the Holy Spirit empower us, friends, to make choices each day to help us embody Christ. May it be so among us today. Amen.